Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. In today's video I want to show you this little unit I've got here. It's an HDMI network television sender. Now the idea of this unit is that you have it in combination with a receiver unit that you place somewhere else on your network. So you can connect this transmitter to uh, perhaps a TV or a games console or a PC on your network or whatever and it will convert the HDMI signal into network packets and then somewhere else on your network you have the receiver and you plug that into a television or a computer monitor or whatever and uh, by that method you can transmit the HDMI signal across a network. Now the units are available for sale on eBay for about $40 each, $40 for the transmitter and $40 for the receiver. This is the Lenkeng LKV373A. Now the reason I have this unit is thanks to a little tip-off I got via Reddit to Dan Man's blog. And on this blog the author has been explaining how he's been doing a series of experiments with these devices. And he's discovered that they can function as a very low cost uh, HDMI video capture solution. Which is very interesting to me because on the Open Tech Lab I'm going to need to be doing a little bit of uh, HDMI video capture for coming videos. So I've been experimenting with this device for the past few days and I'd say that it's not the perfect device, there are some temperamental features about it, but uh, all the same it should be possible for me to get some good use out of it. So let's have a look at it in a bit more detail. So with the device I received this little manual which provides a bit more information about how it works. Now on the first couple of pages there isn't much to see apart from the obvious, and then if we turn over, uh, there's some more in interesting information towards the back. So if we look at these uh, scenarios here, it shows different ways that the device can be used with a network. So in the first example, it shows how you can connect a DVD player to a TV uh, with an Ethernet connection between the HDMI sender and the receiver. And in the second example, it shows how you can do the same thing. Uh, but have a series of Ethernet switches uh, between the two, so you have a more complex kind of network uh, in the middle. And then in the third example on the back, it shows how you can use uh, a single sender and then send that signal off to multiple receivers, multiple TVs, via multiple receiver units over the network. Now, the reason this information is interesting is that it's, it shows that the device uh, it's pretty much certain to be using a standard IP-based networking protocol and not any kind of custom Ethernet signaling. And it also shows that uh, the device, in the way that it works, is that it must be using some kind of broadcast or multicast uh, uh, transmission so that uh, this one transmitter, the packets from it, can reach the uh, three receivers shown in this diagram. Now if we turn to the back of the manual, we can see there's a bit more information here in the specification table. So the first item on the list, it claims that this is compatible with HDCP, which is the content encryption algorithm for HDMI. Uh, I'm not sure if this is really the case, but it claims to be in this table anyway. It says the transport protocol is HDBIT-T, which is not a standard I've heard of. I'm not sure if this really is a standard protocol or if this is just something the company have come up with. It lists the resolutions the device is compatible with and uh, various information about the uh, distances and the cabling that it can transmit over. Though of course if you're using a standard network with switches and so on then it doesn't really matter what the lengths are. And then it uh, gives a bit of information about the power usage and the weight of the unit, its dimensions, and it even tells you that it's black in colour if you if you didn't already know that. Now looking at the exterior of this unit, I'm really quite impressed. It feels really, really solid. It's got some kind of uh, quite chunky aluminium black anodized enclosure here. And uh, I really think that uh, if this unit were to go out on the road or be used in some kind of live stage work, in physical terms at least, it certainly seems uh, to me like it will be well up to the job and would take quite a punishment and uh, still remain in one piece. So that's very good. So let's do a quick little tear down and see what we can find inside. So it's just got these uh, four screws here. There we are. 
So now we've got the lid off, let's have a look at this unit in a bit more detail. So you can see there are two main chips, this one and this one, and uh, they both got heat sinks attached to the top. Now, uh, without uh, removing the heat sinks, I can't really show you uh, what this, the markings on the chips themselves is. And I don't really want to remove the heat sinks because uh, I don't have any heat sink adhesive. So I would, um, I would not be able to get my heat sinks back on, which would be bad. So unfortunately, you'll just have to uh, guess what might be underneath there. Uh, but looking at the layout of this board, it seems pretty clear that this uh, chip's job is to capture the HDMI signaling. And then uh, this chip is uh, doing the job of running the system application. So it takes the video imagery from here and uh, sends it out on the network. And uh, we can tell this because there's a wiring from the HDMI connector here to the, H the HDMI receiver chip. And then there's some wiring that's visible between uh, these two processors. And then there's some wiring that's visible between this processor and this chip, which is an Ethernet Phi. Uh, which drives the Ethernet uh, link going out to the network. Uh, this block here is uh, the magnetic coupler that um, uh, basically uh, drives the Ethernet lines going out of this connector. Then uh, the two major chips uh, need somewhere to store all their software. So there are these two wind bond flash chips here and here. Uh, one for each processor, and then the only thing we seem to have left on this side is uh, a big power supply. Uh, these big uh, inductors here are telltale sign that uh, we've got a big switch mode power supply that uh, supplies power for the whole board. Now, on his blog, Dan Man has a teardown of the device where he's removed the heat sinks from the processor chips in the device, and he seems to think that these two chips are custom made for this product. And looking at the markings on the chip, I'd say that's quite likely to be the case. Then if we look at the reverse side of the board here, there doesn't seem to be anything much here at all, apart from this uh, Atmel EEPROM, which is located right next, to the, uh, right next to the HDMI connector. So perhaps this uh, contains the EDID data. And then there's a chip here, which is completely unmarked. So I really don't know what that, uh, that would be, uh, but it can't be very complicated if it's only got eight legs. Now if we power the device up and attach it to an Ethernet cable, pretty much immediately it starts sending large amounts of information out onto the network. And according to Dan Man's blog, we can receive this in VLC, and to do that we can just go into the media menu and open network stream, and uh, select the address UDP uh, at 239.255.42.42 port 5004. And so if we hit play, we will see uh, that we'll receive a blank screen saying no connection because, of course, we haven't attached one yet. So what we've done here is VLC has been configured to receive the imagery from the multicast address that the HDMI sender box is sending all the imagery out onto the network with. So to test the device, I've attached a Raspberry Pi to the HDMI input, and as you can see here, uh, it's got the output of the uh, terminal as it, the device booted. There's no GUI installed on it, so all we're going to see is the terminal. But let me log in. The uh, username is Pi, and the default password is Raspberry. Now we're logged in. And uh, let's uh, give it a quick test with CMatrix. and we have entered the matrix, and it looks like uh, our video capture is working quite nicely. Now to really put this thing through its paces, I've attached my Acer Aspire S7 laptop, which is running Linux Mint, and uh, I've got GLX gears running here to uh, give a bit of movement to the output. And uh, as you can see, we're getting a great quality video signal coming through with no issues at all. And with the sound test panel up, you can see we're even getting working sound. Front, left front, right. So let's have a look at what formats the imagery is being sent to us in. And to do that, I'm going to go into the tools menu and select codec information. And you can see there are two streams, zero and one. The zero stream is the video. The first stream is the audio. And uh, the video is being sent in H.264 at 1080p at 30 frames a second with a color space format of YUV420 and the audio is being sent in MPEG audio format.
Now to test the latency of the whole system, I'm running GNOME clock on the laptop and then we can see how long it takes the uh, time values to get from the laptop through the sender and into VLC. Now VLC by default, when you connect to a network source, suggests a one second uh, network caching interval, which would add a second to this latency. But in this case, I've set the network caching to zero and it doesn't seem to have much of a detrimental effect on the stream stability. So I think zero is a fine value to have. And at the moment, I'm getting 1.6 seconds of latency between the laptop and VLC showing the captured imagery. Now if we pull up Wireshark here, we can see the reason why VLC is able to receive the imagery this way. And if we have a look at the data we're receiving, you can see that every single packet here is the light blue, indicating they're, they're all UDP packets. And you can see for the most part they are this MPEG-TS type, uh, and these packets contain all the video imagery. So if I stop the capture here and we have a look at one of these uh, and pull them up, you can see that they have a larger, a large amount of video imagery in these set of chunks that are stored within the UDP packet. Now, for the most part, this is uh, all standard stuff for MPEG-TS transmission over UDP, and it's uh, standard enough for UDP to be, uh, for VLC to be able to receive it. But uh, intermingled with the MPEG-TS packets, there are these weird zero-length UDP packets, which are, as far as I understand it, not standard for the MPEG-TS stream. And it seems that some receiver players get confused by these zero-length packets. So just watch out for that if you're trying to receive it with players other than a modern version of VLC. You may find that they get a bit confused by these zero-length packets. So one example of an application that really struggles with these zero-length UDP packets is FFmpeg. And to demonstrate the issue, I'm going to attempt to play the stream using FFplay. So I'll just call up my command here, and we're going to take the input from the UDP stream at the multicast address on the correct port. Now, all being well, we should expect to see a full screen video window appear. So let's see what happens. And we get a rather vague sounding uh, error message coming out, and that's all. Unfortunate. Now, the question is, what can be done about this? And ideally, I'd hope to think that someone watching the stream might be motivated to patch FFmpeg to fix the issue. I really think that it should be possible to make FFmpeg tolerate zero-length UDP packets. It seems like a, a valid thing for it to be able to ignore gracefully. But in the meantime, someone has suggested a workabout which involves uh, adding a firewall rule uh, to IP tables uh, that will just delete any packets that are... Uh, zero length UDP packets. So the command uh, that's been suggested uh, looks like this. So it's sudo IP tables dash T raw dash A pre routing P UDP packets. We care about the length and we want that to be 28, which is, uh, by the way, the length of an empty payloaded UDP packet. So let's add that and see what happens. So the uh, rule is now added to the IP tables. So let's try again with our ffplay command and see what happens. And we get some messages and a bit of a delay. And there we have it. We have the stream coming in from the laptop. Excellent. OK, so now we've got the stream. We want to go and delete the IP tables rule. Uh, by the way, this rule won't persist through system reboots. So anytime you reboot the machine, you just need to run this command again. And if we want to delete the command, uh, we just change the A to a D, and then the rule is removed again. So if we want to capture the video, one way we can do that is with VLC. So to do the capture, I'll go in the media menu and select convert slash save. And I'll select the network tab, and I've got the UDP address of the multicast and I'll select convert-save here and uh, then I need to create a new encoding profile so let's go ahead and do that and I want my encapsulation to be mp4 and uh, for the video codec I'll select that I want to keep the video and I want to keep it in its original form I don't want any transcoding or modification of any kind 
And then for the audio, it's the same thing. I want to keep the audio track in its exact original form so that I have a byte for byte representation of what's coming in uh, from the capture device. And now let's give this thing a name. I'll call it MP4 pass through. Let's create that and go ahead and select that from the list of profiles. And then we need to give a file name for the uh, capture test.mp4. And now let's start the capture. And now this thing is very happily working away in the background capturing some video. And with the firewall rule in place, we can do something very similar with FFmpeg. It takes a few moments to connect. And there we have it, it's receiving the data bytes into an MP4 file. Now I should think a lot of people might want to use this for live game streaming. Well, I'm no pro gamer, but uh, it seems like it works pretty well to me for that purpose. This is MindTest, which is an open source Minecraft-like game. It's a ton of fun, check it out. Now if we look at the source address of the video imagery we're receiving, we can find out the network address that the device has selected for itself. And it turns out that it gets this address from the DHCP server on the network. Now the first time I navigated to this address in a web browser, I was presented with a page that looks like this. And it doesn't really offer any kind of options or configurations or anything, just uh, buttons to upgrade the firmware for the two chips, one for the main chip and one for the encoder chip. Now, looking at the blog, uh, the author links to a secret repository of firmwares that he managed to get to by talking to the eBay sellers. Now, I'm not sure why Lenkeng don't officially list upgrade firmwares on their website. It seems rather strange to me. It seems a bit shady that you can only get the firmwares from the eBay sellers. But all the same, the repository seems legit, and the latest firmware has some interesting improvements to the features of the device. Now, if you upgrade your firmware to the latest version, you're going to run into the same problem I had, which is that, unlike the old version, the new version has a password login page, and you're not going to know what the password is. And it's not the default password, and it's not a blank password or anything like that. So in order to get through to the device, we need a way to reset the password so we can talk to it again. Fortunately, within the repository, there is this IPTV control center application you can download. So let's have a look at it and see what it can do for us. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the application running in either Wine or React OS. So to my annoyance, I have to fire up my very elderly copy of Windows Vista, which is the only copy of Windows I own, just to get this application going. So if we run up the control center application, we can see the first thing we're presented with is a device scan page. So if we kick off a scan, all being well, it should pick up the device on our network pretty quickly. And you can see it's picked up my device right there. Now, if we go into the TX setup page and select the device we just found, uh, you can see that there are now a whole bunch of options for us available to reconfigure the device. But the only one I really care about right now is the factory reset button here. So if we go ahead and click that, it takes a few seconds, and by the time it's finished thinking, the device should have a reset password. Now, it would be really cool if someone could reverse engineer the protocol and write a cross-platform version of this application. It could be done very easily in Python, and I do it myself, but I've got a whole backlog of other things that I want to make videos about first, so I'm not going to do that right now. So now we've upgraded the firmware, the question is, what does that upgrade actually get us? And uh, as far as I can tell, it's two things that I really care about. The first is that uh, previously when streaming at full HD 1080p, it would downscale the video to 720p, no good for full HD streaming. And uh, the other thing is it adds a whole bunch of user options so that the device can be configured through a web page. So let's log into the device to see how that works. So now we've reset the password, we can have another go at logging into the device and the password will be the default. So the username is admin and the password is 123456. So let's log in. Takes just a moment. And here we are, we can see we're now logged into the device and we have a whole configuration page here and there's a lot of options. So let's have a look at those in more detail. 
So let's have a look down the list of options. So in the first group, we've got settings for the video quality and the data rate and the uh, resolution. Uh, we've got settings for uh, the multicast address and how the data is streamed across the network. Uh, you can change the password, you can upgrade the device firmware, you can set its network address settings, you can set the uh, board rate of the UART that's on the PCB, and you can upgrade the firmware. Now the weird thing about this page is that not every option that's available in the control center UI is available in this web page. There are one or two items that are missing. And there are some further options that are only available through the web API. So you can only uh, reconfigure certain things by sending certain web requests to it. Now looking down the list, one of the most promising settings on offer is this multicast checkbox. Because one of the problems I'm having with this device is that it transmits all the video data to the multicast address, which of course means that it ends up transmitting HD video data at a very high data rate to every node on my network, including over Wi-Fi. And the result of this is that it's making a denial of service attack on my wife's ability to watch Netflix, which is not making me popular. So ideally, I'd like to change it to Unicast directly to the PC that's going to receive the imagery. So what I can do here is I can uncheck the multicast checkbox. But unfortunately, there's no button here for you to specify what the Unicast address should be. All you can do is specify multicast addresses. So we have a bit of a problem with that. So the workabout that someone came up with is to send in a web request manually. So the command I'm going to send here is a command to the IP address of the device, to this info.cgi. Uh, the stream info is the action. UDP equals no, RTP equals yes, multicast equals no, unicast equals yes. The multicast address is the address of the PC, except this is the unicast address in this context, and the port remains 5004. So let's see what happens when we issue that command. And we got a message back which contains no text, just a little bit of an HTML. So now we've made that change, let's see if it works. So we'll go into the media menu again and open network stream and we'll open the network address UDP colon slash slash at colon 5004, which is to say we're gonna display all UDP packets coming into our address at 5004. We don't have to specify the multicast address anymore. So let's hit play and see what happens. And it seems to be working. This is very good news. I will now be a popular man with my wife. Now as a final experiment, I've gone and added my Google Chromecast to the HDMI capture device. And uh, this time the results are not so good. In fact, it's not working at all. Uh, so if we look at VLC here, uh, it is actually in the playing state, but there are no valid frames, uh, no valid compressed data blocks coming through. So nothing is being displayed. And the reason for this is because the Chromecast uses the HDMI uh, uh, DRM content encryption, HDCP, and so uh, the unit can't send out uh, the frame data. Now, as various commenters on the blog post pointed out, there is a way to sidestep this issue in that uh, there are devices on the market that have the capability to strip off the uh, encryption. And uh, they do this because uh, the encryption protocol used in HDMI is uh, known. It's in the public domain. It was broken some years ago. Uh, but it still isn't in the US legal to um, produce devices that ignore the content encryption. But many Chinese vendors don't really care about this. And so there are a few Chinese devices on the market around that uh, in the course of their operation remove the DRM encryption. For example, there's a range of uh, HDMI splitters where you can power multiple TVs off a single input. And these devices do exactly that. They strip off the DRM. So people are suggesting that the best way to make the HDMI network sender box work with encrypted content is to uh, add one of these HDMI splitter devices in front of it. But I haven't actually bothered to go into any of this kind of thing because I don't really need to capture from anything that uses DRM right now. Uh, but, you know, if I need it in the future, I probably will add it in. 
Now if we take a close look at the IPTV control center software, we can see this little drop down hidden away in the corner here which talks about two modes of operation for the network cable, and that is network mode and loop through mode. So network mode would be the UDP packets that we've been seeing containing the H.264 data. Uh, but loop through mode suggests uh, a mode of operation where they're not using any of that networking stuff at all and uh, they're doing something completely custom down the wire to just send the HDMI signal directly. So what you would see wouldn't involve any network packets. It may not even involve any valid Ethernet frames. And uh, this is backed up if we have a look at the manual by some of this wording here. It talks about it being very important to make sure that the uh, cables that you use uh, completely follow the IEEE standard, as it's written here, uh, to make sure that every single conductor within the wire is wired up correctly, because otherwise it won't work. And of course, if you just have uh, an HDMI sender talking directly to a receiver, there really isn't any need for there to be any networking between the two, because, well, they can just talk directly in some HDMI language. So that just about completes my little introduction to this uh, HDMI capture device. I'm hoping to get a great deal of use out of this thing. And I should think it's not for everyone. I know some people don't like hacked up devices like this. They like something that's a little bit more uh, made for purpose and maybe has a better brand and is more reliable and all this stuff. But uh, personally, I rather like taking something like this and repurposing it. And it's so cheap. It is by far the cheapest HDMI capture solution I've seen. So for putting me onto this, I've got to give a big thanks to Dan Man and his blog and all the things he's written. And also all the commenters who chipped in with useful information. So do go and check the blog out. It will be linked in the show notes. And if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.